October, all roads to Fatima were thronged with people who made their way through the driving rain. They came to wait and to watch. The children kneel and look up into the sky. Lucia arranges her shawl and kerchief as though she were in church. Kneel down, everybody. She's coming. My lady, you have come. I have come, Lucia, as I promised. This is the day that I will tell you who I am and what it is that I wish you to tell the world. Tell us. Tell us who you are. I am the Lady of the Rosary. What's the matter? Behold my heart, encircled with thorns, which ungrateful men place there by their blasphemy. Tell them, children, tell them that they must not continue to offend our Lord with this roaring. This war is about to end, but if sinners do not cease to offend God, it will not be long before another more terrible war will come. Then the night will be illuminated with a great light, and men will know that it is a sign from God that punishment for their transgressions will fall upon the world again in the form of war, hunger, and persecution. Tell this to the world. How can we tell them, Blessed Mother? Ask the consecration of the world to my Immaculate Heart and promotion of the practice of offering Holy Communion of Reparation to my heart on the first Saturday of the month. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. Otherwise, great errors will be spread through the entire world, which will cause wars and persecutions against the church. Good people will be martyred, and the Holy Father will have much to suffer. Nations will be destroyed, but in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph, and peace again be granted to the world. Blessed Virgin Mary warned that communist Russia would spread her errors throughout the world if mankind did not mend its godless ways. Another message concerned the vision of hell and the end of World War I. The third message is a closely guarded secret known only to the Pope and the last survivor of the three children, Sister Lucia da Santos. Pope John Paul met with Sister Lucia in Fatima on May 13, 1982, when he went there to thank the Virgin for his recovery from an assassination attempt exactly one year earlier. During the visit, he consecrated the world to the Virgin Mary's care under the title of the Immaculate Heart, just as Pope Pius XII had done in October 1942. The small white statue of Our Lady of Fatima was flown to the Vatican March 24, 1983 at the Pope's request. It was transported in a mahogany cask on a Portuguese commercial flight to Rome and then by Italian army helicopter to the Vatican where Swiss guards carried it into the Apostolic Palace. Pope John Paul spent several hours praying before the statue in his private chapel before it was carried in procession to St. Peter's Square early March 25th. The week consecration in St. Peter's Square 
came at the end of a special open-air mass dedicated to the family and organized as part of the celebration for the special Holy Year of Redemption proclaimed by Pope John Paul to mark the 1,950th anniversary of the death of Jesus. Keep the Faith has designated May 1st, 1985 as the start of a Rosary Crusade throughout the United States. A Rosary Crusade, the only hope and salvation for America. With an important and timely commentary on the Rosary and this Rosary Crusade, here is Father John O'Connor, O.P. Father O'Connor was born in Chicago in 1929, attended Notre Dame University, joined the Order of Preachers in 1949, and was ordained in San Francisco in 1955. After graduate studies, he received degrees in theology and philosophy, taught for 11 years in colleges in Madison, Wisconsin, and Austin, Texas, and served as an associate pastor in New Orleans before becoming a mission preacher in 1969. Here is Father O'Connor. Growing up in the city of Chicago, our dad was the stagehand at the McVickers Theater in the Loop, downtown Chicago. And about once a week, my mother, sister, and I would get an early start to downtown do our shopping so that we could catch the last show at the McVickers Theater. And generally, it never ended before midnight, and sometimes it wasn't over until one in the morning. We would then meet our dad at the stage door, and he would take us all to Pixley and Ellers restaurant just down Madison Street. And in those days, they had their own bake shop on the premises, and they made delicious sugar rolls. And our dad would get us each a big, juicy sugar roll. I can still remember the, they were warm, and the butter would melt on them, and he'd get us coffee and, and milk. And then we'd board our streetcar around 2 o'clock in the morning. We lived at the very outskirts of the city of Chicago. And our streetcar would go directly through the black neighborhood. And I can remember as a boy, uh, seeing black people get on the streetcar and ride with us for a ways, and then they'd get off the streetcar, and we were never afraid. We were not afraid of black people, and they weren't afraid of us. Very often, I would fall asleep on my dad's shoulder. And sometimes, too, he would put his head up against the window pane and he'd doze off, too. On weekends, when the streetcar would be very crowded, we could seldom sit together. Sometimes my mother and sister would be at one end of the car, my dad and I at the other end. But we were never concerned about their safety. We never had any reason to think that they were in any danger. When we reached the end of the line, we still had a good half mile walk home, most of which was down dimly lit side streets. In those days, if we had one lamp post at the intersection, we were lucky. So we'd get home about three o'clock in the morning. And of course, my job was to take our dog Fritzy for a walk. She had been cooped up in the house all day, and you can imagine how happy she was to see us. So I would take Fritzy around the block, and if I were especially tired on the way back, I'd cut down our alley, which was pitch dark. But I was never afraid. The thought never occurred to me that there might be any danger in going down this dark alley at 3 o'clock in the morning. Well, that was 40 years ago. Today, people, both white and black, are afraid to walk down those same streets in broad daylight. When I was reassigned to the Chicago area in 1970, my superior's first instruction to me, he said, when you take a priory automobile and drive through Chicago, as soon as you get inside, be sure and lock all the doors from the inside. 
About that same time, I got into a conversation with a lady who told me that she had already been mugged three times on the streets of Chicago, usually while standing in broad daylight at a corner waiting for a bus. In the last 20 years, violent crimes have quadrupled in the United States. Between 1962 and 1982, violent crimes increased 400% in America. According to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, in 1981, there were 13 million major crimes reported in America. And they say that most crimes go unreported. And there were 13 million major crimes that were reported. Every day in our cities, $20 million is stolen in shoplifting. And it's estimated that the average American family has to pay an extra $400 a year simply to cover the retailer's losses to shoplifters. Every day in America, $2 billion is stolen by fraudulent credit cards. And when I came across this particular statistic in my note, I felt I had made a typographical error that it should be $2 billion a year. So I went back to my sources to make sure, and sure enough, I was right the first time. $2 billion a day is stolen in the United States through fraudulent credit cards. In a year's time, that's triple the national deficit. In the United States, $500 million a year is done in vandalism in our public schools. One half billion dollars a year of our school tax money goes simply to replace uh, buildings and materials that have been vandalized by the students themselves. Every year in the United States, between 65 and 75,000 teachers are attacked on school grounds and most often by their own pupils. As many as 75,000 teachers every year are attacked on school grounds. In yesterday's Chicago Sunday Tribune, there was a column by Roger Simon, full-length page column, in which he detailed the violent and senseless street crime that is taking place everywhere in the United States. And he summed it up in this way. Much is written about international terrorism, about how we must meet its challenge. But here, right here at home, a creeping senseless terrorism, a terrorism that is slowly changing our lives, is taking over our country. This past week, Two American citizens were brutally murdered in this recent airplane hijacking in Iran. Two American citizens, after a week of uh, torture, a week of terror, were murdered. Every night in the city of Chicago, anywhere from six to ten American citizens are murdered right on our streets. Here is the real terrorism that's taking place in our country today. My God, what has happened to our beautiful America? When I was a sophomore in high school, the closest I ever got to a pornographic magazine was one afternoon out on the playground. A fellow came around, and inside his jacket, he showed us an address that we could write to out in Hollywood, California. And they would send us these dirty pictures 
in a plain, unmarked envelope. Hollywood, California is 2,400 miles from Chicago. That's the closest I ever got to a dirty magazine as a kid. Well, that situation took a change for the worse in 1958 when the Communist Workers' Party of America appropriated in their budget $8 million to get pornography started in our country. Today, it has grown to a $7 billion a year industry. There are over 400 different pornographic magazines being published every week in our country. There are 20,000 of these so-called adult bookstores and peep shows throughout the United States, twice as many as there are McDonald's hamburger restaurants. You are as aware, aware as I of how frequently we pass a McDonald's. In my travels throughout the United States, there's hardly a town that I go through that doesn't have at least one McDonald's, and sometimes they have two, one at each end of town. Well, every time you pass a McDonald's restaurant, you can know that somewhere lurking in our city limits are two so-called adult bookstores and peep shows. Indeed, you don't have to go to our city limits. You can walk into any 7-Eleven convenience neighborhood grocery store and find shelf after shelf of dirty, filthy magazines. The Reverend Donald Wilman of the National Federation of Decency went personally to the chairman of the board of the 7-Eleven Corporation and pleaded with him to remove these filthy books from these convenience stores. His answer was a categorical no. The reason he gave is that these pornographic magazines were one of their biggest money makers, namely $68 million a year 7-Eleven makes on pornographic literature. And he said it would be simply impossible for him to explain to his stockholders this drop in revenue if they were to remove these dirty magazines from their convenience stores. And according to the United States Senate, anywhere from 75 to 90 percent of all pornographic literature ends up in the hands of children. When I was still in grade school, in the third grade, to be exact. One afternoon after school, we were out playing in an empty lot. One of our pals came along, and he had a couple of cigarettes. Apparently, they had fallen from his dad's pocket. So we immediately repaired to a stairwell in a nearby apartment building, and we began puffing away on those cigarettes. And the beauty of a third grader smoking a cigarette, his first is his last. We got so sick on those few cigarettes that I gave them up for the rest of my youth. Well, that is the closest that I ever came as a youngster to a narcotic in the city of Chicago, if we can call nicotine a narcotic. Today, it is easier for our children to get a reefer, a pot, or even a fix of cocaine. It is easier for them to get it on the playgrounds of their grade schools than it is for them to get a can of Coca-Cola. Three years ago, the third largest industry in the United States was selling narcotics to our children. The following year, the narcotics industry in America outgrossed even General Motors, the second only to Exxon, the giant multinational oil cartel. Last year in 1983, the drug industry outgrossed even Exxon. It took in $80 billion in one year. The most thriving, lucrative, 
profitable business in America today is destroying our children with drugs. The United States Customs Office says that every night we are invaded by at least 80 plane loads of narcotics that fly over our borders from Mexico and South America and land at clandestine airports. Every night we are invaded by 80 plane loads of narcotics. In the city of Miami alone, drug pushing is rivaling tourism as the chief source of income. It's estimated that drug pushers in the city of Miami alone take in $7 billion a year. Several years ago, the distinguished commentator, Mr. Edwin Newman, had a special on television about drug running in just the state of Florida. He interviewed smugglers who every night in high-powered speedboats go out uh, from the coast of Florida beyond our territorial limits where there is always a fre freighter laden with drugs lying off our coast. They pick up just one load of narcotics and bring it back to our shores and they average as their take, these smugglers, $80,000 a night. Less than 1% of the American workforce makes $80,000 a year. These drug smugglers take that much in every night. Now, every once in a while, they are caught, apprehended by our Coast Guard. They couldn't care less. They pay off their fine, which is usually nominal, in cash. Their speedboat may be confiscated. They go out and buy a bigger and faster motorboat, and the next night they are right out there smuggling drugs into our shores. We might wonder how they are able to get by our Coast Guard so frequently. The answer is simple. These freighters laden with narcotics are convoyed by the Cuban Navy. They are guaranteed safe passage through the Caribbean from South America by the Cuban uh, naval gunboat. Then once they, this freighter has been escorted to our shores, these gunboats use their radar to examine the, the coastline of Florida and are able to tell these smugglers those areas which, at least for the moment, are unprotected. Thanks to the Cuban Communist Navy, they are more often than not able to reach our shores without being apprehended. A Cuban intelligence agent who defected reported to our Senate that these freighters laden with narcotics have to pay a tribute to Fidel Castro, depending on their size and cargo, of anywhere from $800,000 to $900,000 for each freighter that the communists convey to our shores. Today, only oranges outgrow more than growing marijuana in the state of Florida. Marijuana farmers already make more money than those who grow grapefruit and lemons. The growing of marijuana is second only to the Florida orange crop. And in Hawaii, the chief cash crop is already marijuana. When I was a kid, Hawaii was known for pineapples and cane sugar, but no longer. Its chief cash crop today is marijuana. In the state of Oregon, every year, enough marijuana is grown in just one year to keep every pothead supplied for 10 years in the United States. The result is that today, one out of three kids uses some narcotic regularly. One out of every three American youth is a junkie, is a drug addict in America today. One out of five young adults uses cocaine regularly. This is why our cars don't work anymore. This is why so many of our appliances break down on us. 
There are so many industrial accidents caused in the United States. This is why prices are so extra high in our country. Because there are so many accidents on the assembly line, so much inefficiency that is being caused by drug addiction. 60% of high schoolers have experimented with marijuana. Uh, this was discovered by Mr. Edwin Newman in asking the students themselves. Six out of ten American high school schoolers has, has already experimented with marijuana, and 14% are potheads. One out of seven is addicted to smoking marijuana. And who are the people that are pushing these drugs on our children today? Several years ago, I was giving a mission in the heart of the prairies of Illinois, a beautiful, idyllic, rural setting. It was a small town, little more than a wide space in the highway, with a gas station and a general store. Yet the pastor told me that he had one of the fastest growing parishes in his diocese. People were moving out from St. Louis, from Springfield, coming up from Cairo, hoping to get away from the evil influences of the city so that they could safely raise their children in the country. That week, the small town newspaper reported that two men had been apprehended right on the grade school grounds selling dope to grade school children. Who do you think these two men were? Hardened criminals from the Chicago Mafia? Soldiers sent out from New York organized crime? No. They were high school students who were selling dope to the grade school kids in order to make some extra spending money. Last September, I was giving a mission in South Dakota. A woman was visiting friends in town. She was from Minneapolis. She told me that the previous summer, her cousin had flown in to visit them. They went to the airport to pick him up. By mistake, he grabbed the wrong bag, the wrong suitcase. When they got it home and opened it up, it was loaded with narcotics. They took it immediately to the FBI. The agent later told them that this one suitcase of narcotics was worth just a little less than $1 million in street value. The FBI were able to track down the two men that checked that bag. And who do you think they were? They were college students who were smuggling these drugs on the side just to make some extra money so that when they went back to college, they could have a real good time for themselves. While giving a mission in southern Illinois, a sheriff told me, he said, Father, I don't bother arresting these drug pushers anymore. I would see them on the street selling drugs to kids. I would arrest them. Then he said I would have to drive them all the way to the county seat. Once I got them booked, I had reams of reports and files that I had to fill out. As a result, I would get home late for supper, and by the time I drove back to my town, those two pushers were right out on the street again selling drugs to kids. The judge had let them go. My God, what is to become of the children of America? Last year, Dr. James Strain, the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, at a convention held in Chicago, said, and I'm quoting him, teenage drug abuse, alcoholism, suicide, have grown to such epidemic proportions that living to adulthood may be an unrealistic expectation for many young people in America today. When we were young, we dreamed of growing up and pursuing a career, making a contribution to our great country. According to Dr. James Strain, for many youth in America today, this is simply an unrealistic expectation expectation. In order to find out what went wrong in America, and indeed the entire world, 
These problems are not peculiar to us. They exist in Japan. They exist in Poland today. They exist throughout the world. We need to go back 68 years to a small village 90 miles north of Lisbon, Portugal. Not since our Lord's final instruction to his apostles at the Last Supper have the people of God received a more detailed instruction from heaven than was given to you and me and to the world at Fatima in 1917. When the Holy Virgin Mary appeared to three shepherd children on six separate and consecutive occasions, Mary had come from heaven to warn us like a good and loving mother would. She came to warn us that God's patience was at an end and that she was no longer able to restrain the just wrath of her divine son. But the sins and crimes of a rebellious mankind were crying out to heaven for vengeance, and that as a just punishment, Almighty God was about to turn over this planet to Satan and all his minions from hell, who would unleash a reign of terror upon this earth, the like of which mankind had never known. Shortly before his death, the Holy Father, saintly pontiff Pius XII. This was in the middle 1950s. He said that there was more sin in the world at that time than at any other time in all of human history, more than the ancient empires of Persia, Greece, and Rome. Indeed, more sin than before the Great Flood, which destroyed practically the entire human race. What would Pius XII say today? When you and I look back at the 50s as a golden age of decency in America, compared to the immorality that is spreading like a cancer throughout our beloved country. To prevent this, the wrath of God descending upon the world, our dear blessed mother came to plead with us, her children, to help her, to help her restrain the just wrath of God by doing penance and making reparation for the sins of mankind. And then she added, almost prophetically, if my request for penance and reparation are not granted by my children, then she warned, and I'm quoting her exact words, Russia, will spread its airs throughout the world, provoking wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer, and whole nations will be annihilated. In 1917, nobody believed our Blessed Mother. Nobody took these warnings seriously. Because in 1917, Russia was in ruins. Her imperial czar had been forced to abdicate in shame. The once proud Romanov dynasty was about to come to a tragic and bloody end. Her provisional government under Kerensky was torn apart by factions and civil war. Her cities were aflame with riotous and anarchist mobs. The once vaunted Russian army was crumbling, deserting before the Kaiser's invasion. And the Russian people were starving to death by the tens of thousands. And in a few years, this would reach the millions. Yet Mary said the day would come when this Russia would be so strong that it would spread its airs throughout the world. That prophecy, uttered 68 years ago, is being fulfilled today before our very eyes right here in our own beloved America. 
because by the errors of Russia, our blessed mother did not mean communism. The men who rule in the Kremlin are not communists. And masquerading as such is the greatest fraud, the greatest hoax that has ever been perpetrated on the human race. This, I believe, is that great deception that St. Paul warned in 2 Thessalonians would come over the world in the latter days. They're not communists, but we have more communism right here in America than the poor enslaved people of Russia. The Russian people are enslaved under the worst kind of feudalism. Yes the feudalism of the Dark Ages. True, they no longer call themselves princes and, and dukes and counts anymore. No, in the Orwellian new speak, they thought up new titles for themselves. Their party secretaries, their chairman, commissars, comrades, but it means the same thing. They're the landlords. They own the deed to all property in Russia today. The Communist Party is the new aristocracy that owns all land in the Soviet Union, on which the Russian peasants must work on the communes that are owned by the Communist Party. Oh, of course, they don't call them peasants anymore. They've thought up a new title for them, too. They're called workers, but it means the same thing. They have to work on land that is owned by the landlords in the Kremlin. The Communist Party owns all factories, controls all production and industry in the Soviet Union, in which the Russian people have to work at the hours, the rate, under the working conditions determined by the Communist Party. And God help the poor Russian worker who would try to start a labor union and strike for better wages, better working conditions. We've seen what happens to labor unions in the workers' paradise of Poland. Labor unions are outlawed in the workers' paradise. That night, they would be on a lockbox car headed for Siberia, never to be heard from again. We saw what happened to the leaders of solidarity, spirited out of their homes in the dead of night, taken off to an undisclosed destination and cut off from all communication with their families. And my brothers and sisters, this same atheism is spreading like a melanoma cancer throughout the United States. We all remember that infamous Death of God movement that was begun in the 1960s. And these people were deadly serious. They actually believed that they could kill God because to an atheist, God is merely an idea in the minds of the believers, some vestige of the Dark Ages. And they felt that if they could destroy our faith in God, they would thereby kill God in America. We are all aware of the activities of Madeleine Murray O'Hare a leading atheist in the United States, who has said publicly that in her estimation, religion is a form of mental disease. This is exactly how they think in the Soviet Union. When Christian dissidents are arrested, they are first sent to asylum to be analyzed and drugged by psychiatrists. They regard religion as a, a form of mental sickness. We are well aware of the activities of the American Civil Liberties Union, so-called, which is doing everything within its power to strike down God from our public life. One of its founders, Robert Baldwin, boasted that he looked forward to the day when he would see a Soviet America. And yet the ACLU claims that it's working for our liberties. These atheists have taken over our federal government. When our Supreme Court enacted the death penalty against untold millions of helpless babies in their mother's womb, they were following a perfect 
atheistic philosophy of life. In an atheistic country, are you and I created equal? Are you and I, as our Declaration of Independence affirmed, endowed by our Creator with unalienable rights to life? Of course not. In an atheistic culture, you and I are simply evolved monkeys. We are simply a chimpanzees who for some blind, unknown cosmic reason uh, shed their hair and now walk on their hind legs. We're just hairless apes. That's exactly what they call us. We are the hairless apes. You may recall about 10 years ago in our country, when the price of cattle feed skyrocketed, a number of farmers had to slaughter their calves. And many Americans were horrified by this, killing their own calves when people throughout the world were starving. The farmers responded. They said that the price of feed is so high today that if we try to raise these calves to maturity, we will never get our money back at the market. They said, we've got to kill these calves, or we're going to go bankrupt. Who can argue against that? Well, that's the way these atheists, our Supreme Court, looks at us. We're just calves. And if it becomes too inconvenient to feed us or take care of us, or if we are not contributing to their idea of quality of life, why not kill us all? Why not slaughter us? This argument has actually been made on the floor of the United States Senate in favor of abortion, that it is actually cheaper to kill these babies than to put them on welfare. We're actually saving tax dollars by exterminating one and a half million babies a year. And now that the Supreme Court has rammed abortion on demand down the throats of the American people, and they rammed it down our throats, we did not want it. Only twice were the American people given a chance to vote on abortion on demand. In the state of Michigan, which is generally regarded as a very liberal state, and in the state of North Dakota. It was, it was put on the ballot as a referendum before Roe versus Wade. In both cases, abortion on demand was resoundingly defeated by the American people. In the state of North Dakota, 76% of the voters were opposed to abortion on demand, three out of four. When these atheists saw that they could not win at the ballot box, they turned to the atheists on the Supreme Court and they legislated abortion for our country. And this is generally agreed by jurists, that this was not a judicial decision, this was a legislation on the part of our Supreme Court. Even one of the dissenting justices accused the majority of an exercise, and I'm quoting his exact words, an exercise of raw judicial power. And now that they've rammed down abortion, our throats, euthanasia is becoming the law of the land, or as they call it in the new speak, death with dignity, or the right to die. Already eight states in America have enacted the so-called right to die laws, and they're pending in 27 other states. This presentation of a Rosary Crusade is being brought to you by Keep the Faith. Father O'Connor continues on side two of this cassette. Please fast forward to the end of this side. Thank you.
When Barry Keane, the author of California's Natural Death Act, appeared on the Good Morning America program, he admitted that in the final form of his bill, extraordinary means had been changed to life-sustaining means. When asked by the interviewer if life-sustaining procedures meant food and water, Mr. Keene replied yes. Food and water can be withheld from the sick. This is part of their right to die now in California. God help the beloved grandparents of the people of California. They take a beloved father or mother to the hospital in the hope of, of finding some surcease to their suffering, and instead they'll be starved to death by the doctors. And wait till they see the doctor bill for starving a beloved mother to death. We are all aware of that infamous proclamation made by Governor Richard Lamb of Colorado, who advised a group of senior citizens, and I'm quoting his exact words, you've got a duty to die and get out of the way. Let our children the other society build a reasonable life for themselves. And the New York Times, in commenting on this statement by Governor Lamb, the New York Times said, Governor Lamb's fast-moving tongue was off, but his mind was in a decent place. His thinking is, is on track here, that senior citizens have a duty to die and get out of the way. Thanks a lot, New York Times. Who's next on your hit list? John McCormley, a syndicated columnist for the Harris News Service, in a recent article last month, entitled, Death Could Be a Kindness. He suggested that the best thing that we could do for the starving masses of Ethiopia is to let them quietly starve to death. He felt that rushing emergency food aid to Ethiopia was the wrong solution to the problem. That if we help these people survive, they're only going to propagate more children. And the next time they have a famine, starvation, he felt, would even be worse in Ethiopia. So the best thing we can do for these people over there now and for their progeny is to let them all starve to death here and now. This is the atheistic death mentality. My God, how life is cheap in an atheistic culture. This is exactly how Adolf Hitler got started in Nazi Europe. Adolf Hitler did not begin with his gas ovens. They came much later. Adolf Hitler began with abortion and mercy killing. And he didn't start these medical procedures in Germany. Before Adolf Hitler came to power, a quarter of a million Germans had been exterminated by eminent physicians, world-renowned scientists. All Adolf Hitler did was harness these instruments of death and made them a policy of his new order. And our Supreme Court, our Governor Lambs, and our New York Times are leading the American people down the same bloody road that Adolf Hitler took Europe in the 1930s. An atheistic morality has taken over our streets and commerce, and that is why there is so much crime in America today. Blue-collar crime, white-collar crime, credit card crime, computer crime, you name it. Well, why not? Why not steal? For a moment, let us try to think as an atheist. Let us pretend that there is no God, that this world is all there is. Well, if there is no God, there is no heaven. There is no eternal life. There is no hope of ever achieving perfect happiness. For the atheist, 
The only thing that he can ever hope to get is what this world can give him, what he can get here and now. Do you remember that slogan, the now generation? That was the battle cry of the death of God people. And they were saying to our youngsters, get it now. This is all there is. So why not steal? Why should the atheists work their knuckles to the bone, as many of our grandparents and parents did, paying off a mortgage, raising a family, paying taxes? Why? What future is there in that? No, to them, babies are a burden. Babies are something to be avoided. You've got to take pills to protect yourself from this disease they call infants. And if uh, by accident you are afflicted, well, then you kill them in the womb. This is the way atheists look at families and children. So why not steal? Why not embezzle? Why not profiteer? Why not defraud? In an atheistic culture, the only sin is getting caught. I'll never forget when one of those bandits of that famous Brinks robbery was apprehended. Now, he had already bought a beautiful home for his family in the Caribbean, right along the ocean there. And he confessed that he had done it for his family. He didn't want them to grow up in a, a smog-filled a city environment. He wanted to take them out where they'd get plenty of fresh air, go right down to the beach and plenty of exercise swimming. He wanted them to have all the good things in life. He wanted them to travel. Well, what's wrong with that? The only sin he felt he had committed was getting caught. So why not steal? Why not mug? Why not kill and defraud? Especially when we consider that according to the Justice Department, 1% of criminals are ever caught in America. Seven out of every hundred, only they are apprehended. And only 2% ever spend a day in jail. And this is in New York City. The national average is 1%. Only one criminal out of every hundred ever spends a day in jail. Why not steal? Why not shoplift? Why not embezzle? Why not defraud? The atheist has no answer to that except the police state. And that is why, wherever the atheists get control of a country, they turn it into a police state with their KGBs, their secret police, their security police. All know the atheists have taken over the television and motion picture industry in America. They control the entertainment of our children today, and that is why there is so much lust. Not only graphically portrayed on the silver screen and right in our rooms over the television set, not only graphically portrayed, but glorified. What macho hero does not have his live-in mistress or have his uh, casual uh, sexual uh, affair? Everyone from Reynolds to Clint Eastwood. And this is portrayed as the natural, normal way for the American a macho hero to conduct his life. You notice I do not call it sex. Now, they call it sex, but that's not sex. He knows that sex is a beautiful and noble gift of God, a gift that not even the angels have. Not even the angels share in God's power of creation. But just as Almighty God has created each of us in his own likeness, so a husband and wife, united in matrimony, are able to help create another human being in their image and likeness. No, this is a beautiful and wonderful gift, but of course, this is not what the atheists want. What they every perversion of this gift of God. Well, once again, isn't it logical? If the only thing that we can ever hope for in this world is what we can get here and now, what can the average John Doe atheist expect unless he's born into great wealth or political influence it's lust. So why not get all the lust we possibly can in any way that we possibly can? This is the philosophy of atheism. 
But worst of all, my dear friends in Christ, the atheists have taken over public education in America. The atheists control our public schools and university. And these are not my words. These are the words of Dr. P. Shawstall, state superintendent for public instruction for Arizona. And when I read this quotation attributed to him in 1970, I could not believe it. And so I wrote to Dr. Shawstall, and I said, Doctor, did you really say this? He was kind enough, amidst his very busy schedule, to write back to me, and he said, I most certainly did say it. The atheists have taken over public education in the United States. Now, of course, he did not mean this as a wholesale condemnation of the many wonderful, dedicated, patriotic, God-fearing men and women who are working in our public schools. Let us pray for them. Their numbers are rapidly diminishing. They're being full of the educational system. But thank God we know there still are many there. Now what Dr. Shawstall was talking about was a relatively few handful of these atheists who control the education of American children. As God is an outlaw in our public schools. God is outlawed in American public education. Now our public schools can teach about Adolf Hitler, they can teach about Lenin and Stalin, they can teach about Mao Zedong, they can teach about communism, and many of them do. According to U.S. News and World Report, there are 10,000 admitted Marxists teaching in our state universities today. So they can teach about Mao, about Stalin, they can teach about communism and Marxism, but God help the teacher who tries to teach. She's committing a federal crime. She could be arrested, and one of them had. In Warren, Pennsylvania, a fourth grade teacher was fired for saying a prayer, just a little prayer, and reading the Bible story to her class at the beginning, every morning. Well, she was caught. She was fired from her job. She appealed to the Supreme Court, and they upheld her firing. She had broke law. She had committed a crime, praying to God on public school property. As a result, the American youth are getting the same godless education as the children of the Soviet Union. The communists learned early in their career in Russia that the best way to teach atheism was to ignore God. In the beginning, Joseph Stalin used to go around haranguing communist youth rallies, telling them, don't think about God. Don't get interested in religion. It's treason to go to church. Do you know a better way to pique the curiosity of young people? It backfired. No, the communists discovered that the best to teach atheism is to ignore God to make God completely unnecessary and totally irrelevant in education. As a result, our American youth are being taught a science in which God takes no place, in which God is completely unnecessary. They are being taught a history of the world uh, in which religion has no positive influence. And if it is mentioned, it's only uh, to be criticized for the various problems and failures they're being taught a sociology in which there is absolutely no Christian morality. <clears throat> there are many means that these atheists are using today to destroy the faith and moral character of our children. And I'm sure there's not one family here that has not lost at least one son or daughter. We send our children off to these state universities home in a year or two and they don't want to go to Mass anymore or even to some of these so-called Catholic colleges and they come home ashamed of the religion of their parents. This is no accident. This is being done deliberately in the classroom and today it's even being done in our grade school and two of the chief means, there are many, but just the two I want to single out tonight 
The first, of course, is this values clarification program. Now, Dr. Sidney Simon, the originator of values clarification, has publicly admitted that the purpose of these programs is, quote, to change the values children receive from their parents and church. In other words, to destroy their Christian morality, to find their faith in God. It is any wonder that our young people today, so many of them are so rebellious against authority in general and their parents in particular. And I say this, not to condemn our children, but in awe and admiration of any of the youth of America who are able to survive our public school system with a faith in God and a strong commitment to our moral heritage. But, of course, the most insidious means used today are these so-called sex education courses. Now, sex ed has acquired a very bad name and reputation with parents, so today it has to be concealed. It's called family losses, uh, human hygiene courses. It's even called mental health courses. But in practice, they are nothing more than how-to-do-it courses because it is against the law to teach any morality in the public school. No Ten Commandments, as we know from a recent decision of our Supreme Court, not even the Ten Commandments can be inscribed in the hallways of a public school. So these courses that are being presented to our children are completely devoid of morality. They are simply how to do it courses. Very often Planned Parenthood is invited in. The first thing they do is pass out contraceptives to our kids and show them how to use them. They give pills to the girls, give condoms to the boys. Then they assure them that if these contraceptives fail, and of course they do, young people don't want to use those things, they know instinctively how phony contraception is. It's not love, it's a denial of love and a profession of selfishness. They don't use those. So, Planned Parenthood will stage role-playing where a boy and girl will pretend uh, that she's pregnant and now they want to get an abortion. Role-playing, the boys are taught how to contact the local Planned Parenthood, how to look up their number in the yellow pages, uh, how to get on the phone and arrange for an abortion so that the parents will never find out about it. Well, the result of these how-to-do-it courses, according to the National Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, the new world disease is now a pandemic in America. It's no longer an epidemic, if we can speak of an epidemic as merely it is no longer merely an epidemic, it is a pandemic in the United States, an epidemic which is out of control. A National Center for Disease Control publicly admitted they were capable of controlling the spread of venereal disease among our children. There are at least 20 million Americans today who have some form of venereal disease, at least half of which is incurable. It's a lifelong scourge namely genital herpes. That's a viral disease. There is no known cure for it. These youngsters will be afflicted, stigmatized for life with this venereal disease. And yet, syphilis and gonorrhea is fast becoming genetically resistant to penicillin. Even these bacterial venereal diseases can no longer be cured. Uh, with these miracle drugs. Every year, 2,000 more teenagers come down with some form of VD in the United States. A half a million kids, a half a million of our kids, every year are afflicted with this scourge. In the city of New York alone, 36,000 teenagers have venereal disease every year. This is why we are losing our children today. This is why we have lost our beautiful America. And the only question remains is what are we do about? Some of us may disagree tonight about my analysis of what's really wrong in America today, but I'm sure we are all in accord 
in agreeing that this situation is going to get a lot worse before it gets any better in our beloved country. Once again, look to our dear Blessed Mother for the only solution to the problems facing America and the world today. When Our Lady came to us at Fatima in 1917, Europe, indeed the world, was in the grip of frightful and bloody war that had ever ravaged the human race. The first world war ever to be fought. There were days on the fields of Flanders when a hundred thousand soldiers were killed in just one engagement. In the Battle of the Somme, 500,000 of the cream of English youth were driven like cannon powder down the muzzles of the Kaiser. Even to this day, Belgian farmers in plowing their fields are the bones of soldiers too numerous to bury. Yet when our Blessed Mother came to the world to plead for peace, she did not go to Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany. She did not go and plead George of England. She did not appeal to Clemenceau of France or even to Woodrow Wilson. No, our Blessed Mother went instead to three shepherd children, three simple peasant children of Portugal. Our Blessed Mother was trying to tell She was trying to tell us that our world leaders cannot bring us peace. And has not history borne out the truth of Our Lady's message? We had the Versailles Treaty. We had the League of Nations. We had the Kellogg Treaty. We've had the Atlantic Charter. We've had the Geneva Peace Conference. We've had the Paris Peace Conference. We've had the United Nations. Have any of these brought us peace? Or instead, have they not sown the seeds of future and more bitter wars? No, our world leaders cannot bring us peace because they cannot cure the cause of war. As our Blessed Mother explained to Fatima, the cause of war is sin, greed, envy, lust for power in heart, racial ambition, national hatreds, racial vengeance. These are the causes of war. Not rockets and missiles and bombs and peace trade. No, it is sin in the hearts of men causing war in the world today. And as Pius XII said, there is more sin today than at any other time in all of human history. And thus the only cure for sin and for war is our dear Blessed Mother explained penance, prayer and penance. This alone will bring peace to the world. The former Bishop of Fatima was asked to summarize Our Lady's message there he said, I can say three words. The message of Fatima is reparation, reparation, and reparation. This is the only cure for the world's ills. MX missiles, B-1 bombers, Trident submarines, these will not save us. The American taxpayers have spent hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars we have sent our boys halfway around the world. Have we stopped communism? I wonder sometime if we have eased them up. No, Our Lady said, only God can put an end to evil and Marxism in the world. This was the great message of Our Lady at Fatima. And what does God want us to do? Our Blessed Mother also explained this. She said, and I'm quoting her, God wishes to establish devotion to my immaculate heart throughout the world. And so he asked the Holy Father, in union with all the bishops throughout the world, to make the consecration of Russia to my immaculate heart, promising to convert Russia by this means. <coughs> Almighty God wishes to honor the Immaculate Mother of his incarnate Son. Our Lord Christ loves his mother so much that he will forget our horrendous sins 
He will pardon our horrible crimes. He will convert Russia. He will give us the grace to the tide of evil that is enveloping the world if only we will honor his mother. If only we will be devoted to her immaculate heart. And so he asked the Holy Father in union with all the to consecrate Russia to the immaculate heart of Mary. And God then to show how much he loves his mother, to show the powerful intercessory power of her heart, God will be appeased, his wrath will be turned back, and he will convert Russia. Three popes have tried to do this. Pope Pius XII in 1943, Pope Paul VI after the Second Vatican Council, and last the 25th, our beloved Holy Father John Paul II, all three tried to consecrate Russia to Mary's Immaculate Heart, but were prevented from doing it. They consecrated the whole world to Mary's Immaculate Heart, and this is a necessary first step, but they were unable to consecrate Russia. Then, when John Paul II was asked afterward why he did not mention Russia by name, and this is what heaven wants. God wants Russia mentioned by name so that the world will know that because we deserve it, but only to honor his own beloved mother that he will convert Russia. When asked why he did not mention Russia by name, our beloved Holy Father, love of Mary is indubitable. He responded, I did the best I could under the circumstances. If that third secret that was finally sent to John the 23rd was not a message from heaven saying, you are not worthy of this consecration. The world does not deserve peace. I think the reason our sovereign pontiffs were unable to make this consecration because we have failed to fulfill Our Lady's other She said to the children, when enough people, enough people, not just the Holy Father, not just the bishops in union with him. When enough people heed my request, then Russia will be. And when Our Lady appeared at Fatima, for the first time, she held a rosary in her hand. Now, at other apparitions at Lourdes, she had a rosary either at her uh, belt or around her, but at Fatima, she had the rosary right in her hand. She was holding it out before us. She said, say the rosary every day to obtain peace for the world. And after each decade, add the following prayer, O oh my Jesus, bless our sins. Save us from the fire of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. The rosary is the chief prayer of reparation and penance to Almighty God. Do you recall when all began after the Vatican Council? It wasn't caused by the Vatican Council, but it, uh, the enemies of the church took that opportunity. When all our troubles started, do you recall the first thing to be attacked was the rosary? The devil despises that rosary. Yes, it is a little thing. But as the Bible tells us, God chooses the little things of this world to confound the proud. And just as Almighty God, it pleased him to choose the little heel of a humble virgin of Nazareth to crush the head of that ancient serpent. So now it pleases God to choose rosary to crush the power of atheistic Marxism. Our Holy Father John Paul II, the very day of his election, at his first press conference, confessed, he says, the rosary is my favorite personal prayer. Sister Lucia, the only survivor of the three children at Fatima, about ten years ago, sent a letter to her cousin, a Silesian priest here in the United States, and Sister Lucia wrote, the rosary is the most powerful weapon with which we can defend ourselves, because it is only the rosary 
Not missiles, bombs, and submarines, but a rosary that can harness the power of God. The rosary is our secret weapon. I are the greatest and strongest soldiers that America has. And you and I hold in our hands that secret weapon whereby we can harness the power of God. This has been done so many times in history. To gain just a little idea of the power of Mary's rosary, in the 16th century, all of Europe was threatened by the Turkish invasion. The Turks were at the very doorstep of Europe. They had amassed a huge armada and were about to invade mainland Europe. And of course, Europe as usual was divided. Its princes and kings were bickering with one another. The great pontiff, Pope St. Pius V, pleaded rulers of Europe to organize the navy and to go out and meet the Turks. He finally succeeded. It was inferior to the Turkish navy. It was under the command of Don Juan of Austria. They sailed into the Battle of Lepanto, literally on their knees with the sword in one hand and the rosary in the other. Pius V called upon all of Europe for a rosary crusade to turn back the Turkish tide. At the last moment, there was a favorable change in the wind. The Turkish armada was thrown into confusion. Most of their ships were captured by Don Juan. The rest were sent to Davy Jones' locker. 30,000 Turks were killed in that one battle. 15,000 Christian galley slaves were released from the galleys of the Turks just by the rosary. There's only one nation that has succeeded in escaping from behind the Iron Curtain, Austria. Austria, like Bulgaria, Hungary, Poland, was invaded by the Red Army, was occupied by the Red Army. In 1955, Father Peter Pavlicek called upon the, the Austrian people to say the rosary of their country. Only 10%, only one out of 10, joined in a rosary crusade. But that's all it took. On May 15, 1955, contrary to all precedent, to the utter amazement of the international diplomatic corps, the Red Army fairly withdrew from the soil of Austria, and they gained their religious and political freedom. The only curtain behind the Iron Curtain that ever succeeded in doing that. East Germany tried by force of arms. Hungary, their freedom fighters tried by arms and were crushed. All the Austrian people did was take up the rosary and they drove back that dreaded Red Army. Brazil, in 1964, was on the verge, their government had been taken over by communist agents. The men, women, and children took to the streets, chanting Our Lady's Rosary. In San Paulo, 600,000 flooded the streets of their city in a rosary crusade. The communists became so terrified, they fled the country. And the Brazilian people were able to regain their freedom. The same thing in Chile, and the same thing in Portugal. Portugal actually had a Marxist government. And the Portuguese people, loyal to Our Lady of Fatima, took to the streets with their rosaries in a crusade and drove those communists out of Lisbon. In Poland, after the Holy Father's election, expressed a desire to return to his native country. The communist government laid down such humiliating conditions as to make it virtually impossible. The bishops of Poland called upon them to join a rosary crusade that their beloved son could return in triumph to his native land. All it took was a week. Once again, contrary to all precedent, the communist government actually backed down. They lost and they withdrew these humiliating conditions, making it possible for John Paul to return in triumph to the joy and consolation of our suffering Catholics behind the Iron Curtain. My brothers and sisters in Christ, we must begin another rosary crusade right here in the United States. And if we don't do it, who will? It's up to you and me to begin a rosary crusade throughout the United States. 
Our target date is May 1st of Nephi, a national rosary crusade throughout the United States, organized by faithful lay Catholics like yourselves, is the only hope and salvation of America. This rosary crusade is under the direction of Keith the Incorporated. A lay apostolic group just like yourself, uh, they've been stationed for a number of years in New Jersey. Uh, they are putting their presses, they are putting their recording uh, keenly at the disposal of this great rosary crusade throughout the United States. You must begin it tonight. If you are not already saying the rosary with the members of your household, Start saying it tonight as you drive home. If you get home, you finish it down in your living room and finish that rosary together. My God, what consolation you will bring to our suffering Heavenly Mother. Then you've got to find out if the rosary is being said in your parish church. I'm sure in many it is. There are few, but throughout the United States, many courageous, Catholic laity who are leading the rosary every day after Mass and with the, with the pastor's permission every Sunday before Mass. Find out who they are. Join them next Sunday. If you care, swell their numbers. And if the rosary isn't being recited in your parish, go to your pastor and ask for his permission to lead the rosary after Mass or before Mass. And if he says no, and go to another parish until you find a pastor who's willing to have the rosary recited by the laity in his church. Then we've got to appeal to our bishops. Our bishops today are so isolated. So often they are by these uh, bureaucratic um, organizations that today so surround and isolate our bishops from their people. We've got to write to our bishops. We've got to show them that we are behind them. We've got to show them that we still love our Blessed Mother and that we still want her honored in our community. We've got to ask our bishop to sponsor a diocesan-wide rosary crusade on May 1st of 1985. This is the only way that we can save our country. We've tried everything else. Everything else has failed. Only the rosary and a rosary crusade, as it's done many times in the past, will save America. And only you can do it. And if you don't, who will? Thank you, Father O'Connor. Keep the Faith is mailing out 30,000 of these cassettes to faithful Catholics like yourself.